Today's sermon is entitled, Twelve Ordinary Men, the Apostle Andrew, the Apostle of Small Things. The passage I've chosen today is John chapter number 1, verses 35 to 42. My name is Reverend Derek Gelder, and I'm Senior Pastor at McKees Mills Baptist Church, and I want to say a special thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule today. Ever feel like the resources, time, and spiritual gifts that you have to offer God are insignificant to make a difference in His kingdom? If one cannot sing like an angel, preach and thousands become born again, pray and have the earth shake, have faith that moves the mighty mountains, command healing through the power of the Holy Spirit, and have unspeakable love that has no limits and, and is inclusive of all people, then why bother serving inside of God's kingdom? This is a thinking of the world. If you can't be the very best at what you do, then why bother putting any effort into it in the first place? Unfortunately, many Christians foolishly believe that the public results of service are far more important than the object of one's service, that is, pleasing God. While service that is seen by many is often deemed impressive, so are the acts that are done in secret, of which no eye can see except God the Father in heaven. While Apostle Andrew never preached to multitudes of people, never founded any churches, never wrote any epistles, or was mentioned in the book of Acts, as far as we know, he never did any of these great and wonderful things, according to Scripture, and yet his indiscreet service has been heard loud and clear for centuries. From Andrew's testimony, we learn that there are no insignificant gifts, there is great value in inconspicuous service, and evangelism one-on-one -on -one can be very powerful and very effective. Let's look at some background on Andrew before we begin with the heart of the sermon. Andrew's family lived in the city of Bethsaida on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, John 1.44, but moved to Capernaum where he and his brother Peter had a fishing business with James and John who were likely his partners. Andrew's father's name was Jonah or John. And after hearing John the Baptist's testimony that Jesus was the Lamb of God, John 1, 35 to 40, both Andrew and Peter became apostles of Jesus Christ. Andrew is always listed in the top four names of the apostles along with Peter and the two other brothers, James and John. Now, this is really important to get. You know, in today's day and age, well, lists don't mean quite the same thing as they did back then. In ancient times, when you made a list of people, you always put the most powerful or the most popular, most famous, I guess, person at the very top of the list, and always in descending order the people that are less famous or less powerful. Especially when it came to a group, you always put the leaders at the top of the group and then the people that were subservient down below. In scriptures, we know Peter, James, and John were always the three that are mentioned at the top of any list because they were the inner three. They were the leadership of the twelve apostles. However, the fourth name is always Andrew. While the Bible does not mention ultimately the death of Andrew, tradition is rather uniform that he didn't get nailed to a cross, but he actually got taped to the cross and it spent two days there before he finally perished. So Andrew, in, in I guess worldly terms, would not be considered very significant. However, ultimately, I think based on godly terms, he was one of the 12 disciples and he was an impressive individual for sure. Let's look first and foremost. Andrew was the very first disciple. Before he met Jesus, Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist, John 1.35. Well, he, whose name ultimately meant manly, could have been impressed with the rugged uh, features of John the Baptist, somebody who lived out in the desert, somebody, as you can see in the picture, who had uh, clothing made out of wild hair, camel's hair, and then, you know, he had a belt around his waist, and he, it says in scriptures that he ate locust and wild honey. Well, all those things would have impressed Andrew. I don't think that's the main thing that impressed him at all. I think it would have been John's role as the forerunner of the Messiah, as predicted in Isaiah 43 and Malachi 3.1. That would have been what impressed him the most. After all, he knew scriptures and he knew that someone was going to come and someone was going to announce the coming of the Messiah that was going to happen very quickly. You got to realize for 400 years, over 400 years, nobody in Israel had heard from God. The last prophet was Malachi. After that, there was complete silence. This forerunner, John the Baptist, came and he said, look, prepare your way for not only are you going to get a word from God, you are going to get a word from God directly. 
His Son, Jesus Christ, who is God, is going to appear here and He's going to speak to you. Talk about exciting. And that was excitement for, for Andrew. And that's why he became one of the apostles of John the Baptist. John the Baptist ultimately warned the crowd that Jesus would come very soon and those who had faith in his good news would be baptized by the Holy Spirit, but those who rejected him would be like chaff and they'd be burned in the unquenchable fire. Andrews most likely, rec most likely recognized John's words to be the fulfillment of Scripture, and that's why he was a disciple of John the Baptist. So first and foremost, we have this idea that Andrew was already a disciple and he was already there with John. Now, let's go a little bit further. The moment Andrew met Jesus Christ, he became Jesus' disciple. Now, he wasn't disrespecting John the Baptist at all. The second that John says, he sees Jesus out in the horizon, and he says, look, the Lamb of God. The moment he said that, Andrew and the other disciple that was with him, which was most likely John or possibly uh, Philip, they immediately went after him, said, look, okay, John, you had told us that you must become less, and you told us that uh, Jesus will become more. You said to the Pharisees that you weren't worthy to untie the sandals of the person who was coming. We're going to leave you, and we're going to go with Jesus. And John the Baptist was okay with that, because that's exactly what he wanted. He wanted people to go to Jesus Christ. He wanted them to be part of this great and wonderful mission that Jesus had, this good news of the gospel message. Both Andrew and the other disciple with him ultimately left their former teacher. They followed Jesus Christ immediately, it says in scriptures. The very next thing Andrew did was, as soon as he left there, he spent, you know, most of the day with Jesus. He went home and he found Peter. And he said, Peter, Peter, you wouldn't believe who I saw. And of course, Peter would say, who did you see? I thought you went to see John the Baptist. No, Peter, I did go to see him, but I saw the Messiah. I saw Jesus. Jesus is here. Peter, Peter, you got to come and see him. And of course, we know in scriptures that Peter did go and see him. And Peter was the second person to become the apostle of Jesus Christ. We are told in scripture that Andrew and Peter at that time, there's a little bit of confusion in scriptures as to what happened next. But I think they went back to Capernaum. They went back to their fishing business for several months. And then Jesus arrives on the shore of Galilee and he looks at uh, Peter and Andrew and he says, Drop your nets and follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And we're told again, immediately, they both dropped their nets and said, Yes, Lord, here I am. Like Isaiah, take me, I'm ready to go. That's exciting. I don't know about you, but that's really exciting news. The good news made a profound effect in these two people's lives. From Andrew, we learn that he has a leadership style that is quite unique. Andrew and Peter were completely different people when it came to leadership. Peter was often brash, clumsy, harsh, impulsive. Growing up with Peter, Andrew must have known ultimately the moment that, that Peter would join into the group of the disciples, Andrew must have known that he would take a back seat. You know the kind of people that you meet that ultimately are just amazing leaders? You meet them when they're young and they're always in charge of absolutely everything because they would have it no other way. The person that as soon as you get in a group, they automatically want to take charge because that's who they are. That was Peter. Andrew, he realized that, and yet there was no sibling rivalry between the two. Andrew didn't get jealous because Peter became the leader of the 12 disciples at all, the earthly leader, that is. But you know what? He said, you know what? That's okay. Andrew was very fixated on Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone of the church. Andrew was okay with his role. He was not aggressive and bold, but he was one who understood that the small gifts in life and service can be extremely powerful and effective. While you will not find stories of Andrew walking on the water or preaching in front of large crowds like his brother Peter, Andrew's leadership style, I think, is equally impressive because he knew the value of relational ministry. And we hear that term all the time nowadays. His eagerness to follow Christ, combined with his zeal to introduce others, fairly typifies his character. I think we could use more Andrews inside of the church, to be honest. You know, we do need leaders. We do need public leaders that are out there and they want to get things done. We absolutely need that. But we also need the Andrews, who are leaders in the background, who get to know people, whose relationships with people get very strong, and they can influence an awful lot of people because of the relationships they forge through friendship and spending time with other people is incredibly critical. 
For the remainder of the sermon, I'm going to focus on what we can learn from Andrew's service. That is, number one, there is value in inconspicuous service. Number two, there's value in small gifts that we offer to God. And number three, that there's great value in one-on-one evangelism. Let's start off with number one. Seeing the value in inconspicuous service. Often Christians will get involved in, will not get involved in serving unless they're guaranteed that God will reward them handsomely for that service. They say things like, I will tithe lots and lots of money to the church if only God will guarantee that he'll return more money back to me. Or they say, God, I will give you all my free time if only you promise that you will give me all sorts of fame, power, and glory and everybody will recognize me as a holy person. While we don't say these things out loud, many Christians think these things to be true. This might sound preposterous, but we have in scriptures, the mother of the two sons of Zebedee asked that her children be elevated to the right and the left side of Jesus, Matthew 20, 21. We have in scriptures a dispute that erupts amongst the disciples and they, they start arguing which amongst them is the greatest, Luke 22, 24. And we have Peter boldly asking Christ what the disciples would get for having given up absolutely everything to serve in his kingdom, Matthew 19, 27. In response to these um, arguments or these questions that the disciples have about who's the greatest and what they're going to receive, Jesus reminds the apostles ultimately that they're not to be like the Gentiles. They're not to to want to have positions of power and authority, but rather they should be the servants of everyone. If you want to be the first, you must be the last inside of the kingdom of God. Service is not receiving worldly blessings, Matthew 6, 19 to 21, but choosing to be a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1 to 2, in response to God having given us the bread and the water of life. John 6, 34 to 35. Profound. In other words, when we go as Christians and say, I want to be the greatest. I want to be known as holy, perfect, and true. We fall into the trap of pride. And as a result of that, we're not as effective in God's kingdom as we certainly could be because we know pride goes before the fall. Andrew understood all this. And like Andrew, today's leaders must be okay with humbly serving God wherever they might be, whether in the spotlight or in the background. Having his name only mentioned nine times and often being addressed as Peter's brother did not bother Andrew for he knew the value in serving God comes not from the results of service that only God can claim, but in honoring God by serving his creator with everything that he had. To answer Peter's question, what is in it for us? Jesus told the disciples that the reward would one day to be sitting on 12 thrones and judge Israel and to receive eternal life. Andrew was so overwhelmed with joy, for he was like the psalmist. He truly believed that God was his portion and his cup forever. That's all he really wanted. While the apostles started out clamoring for positions of power and authority, later on they learned the value of being living sacrifices, and they risked absolutely everything for the kingdom of God, even though there was no earthly rewards to be found. From Andrew, we learn that effective leadership, whether public or private, only comes to those who are called to become humble servant leaders. And I think we need a lot of those in the church. I'm not saying it's not right to have a public leader. You certainly need those. And you need people who are going to work out in the public eye. That's absolutely critical. But at the same time, you need uh, leaders who are willing, as you can see in this picture, to wash other people's feet, to be servants of all people, to work in the background and tell people over and over again how much God loves them and how much you love them too as well. The second thing that I think we learned from Apostle Andrew is there's great value in small gifts. Andrew was a great leader because he saw Jesus as being able to perform miracles even with the smallest of all gifts. When Jesus crossed the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, in John chapter 6, it tells us that a great crowd followed him because he was healing the sick. So you got to understand this. Realize this. Here you got this crowd that's following Jesus Christ all day long. They traveled a long ways to get to him, and they traveled with him. The day is getting long now. It's coming evening. So eventually they got to leave Jesus and go back to their home in order to spend the night. Jesus is looking at the crowd, and I'm sure the disciples were as well, wondering, what are we going to do? 
We don't want them necessarily to go home on an empty stomach because they might faint along the way, it says in scriptures. So we should really feed them something. But what are we going to do because we don't have any real amount of food? So we have, first and foremost, Jesus, he knows what they're thinking. He goes up to Philip and he tests him. And he says, Philip, you know, why don't you go to the store or the village, back then the village, grocery area, and why don't you go there and ask for a bunch of food? Go buy enough food to feed these people. Of course, Jesus was only testing him. He knew that they could not afford to do so. He, and Philip comes back and says, with an accountant's mind, he says, you know what, Jesus, I would do that, but you know what, it's going to take at least eight months worth of one person's wage just to give everyone a single bite of food. Jesus, there's 5,000 men here, plus women and children, probably ten to 15,000 people. That's not going to do. I don't have the money. We don't have the money to go buy enough food to feed these people. We know in scriptures that the disciples came along and they said, you know what, Jesus, we've got another solution. Why don't you send all the people to the stores in the villages, in the marketplaces, and why don't you tell them to take their own money and go buy their own food and have some food before they go home so they won't faint? That was their decision. Andrew, being the only one who's kind of outside of this bubble, he says, hold on a second now. I don't like either one of these options. There's a boy here. He has five barley loaves and two fish. Jesus, why don't you take what we have and do a miracle? You know, here's the thing that I find so staggering. The disciples were with the Lord Jesus Christ, seeing the same miracles that everybody else in the crowd had saw. He saw Jesus. All of them did heal the sick. So it's not a great big leap of faith to think that Jesus Christ could take food and multiply it. Hardly a leap of faith at all. And Andrew comes forward and says, you know what? I found from this small boy, here's his lunch. This is what he has. He's willing to give it to you, Jesus, because he knows you could do great things with it. And so do I. Jesus, you can feed this crowd. I know you can. I know you can do a miracle. Now that's faith, incredible faith from this disciple. It was at this point that he spoke up and he spoke very clearly. While Andrew would have been aware that this small amount of fish would not feed all of them, he knew that Jesus Christ in his hand, any insignificant gift by worldly standards, can become profound inside of God's kingdom. Jesus then blessed this small amount of food, and he fed all of the people. And it says in scriptures, they had their complete fill. They lacked absolutely nothing. Wow, what a powerful story. What a powerful story of Andrew's faith. From Andrew, we learn the value of offering what little we have to Jesus Christ. I think sometimes foolishly we think that we don't have enough to give to Jesus. Jesus, I don't have enough money to give to you that would make any difference anyway in your kingdom. Or Jesus, I don't have enough skill or talent to give you. Why do you want me? Or Jesus, you know what? I don't have enough time to give you. And that little bit of time that I give you, it's not going to make any difference. Why don't you choose someone else? Choose someone else. But here's the thing. Andrew teaches us that whatever we have, God will use in his kingdom for his honor and glory. Ever look at the offering that you're going to give to church? Ever do this? I mean, every Sunday we sit down, my wife and I, mostly my wife, she fills out the uh, check itself, but we talk about what should we give to church. And we have a set amount that we normally give. But ever go into your bank account and wonder beforehand, can I afford this? Ever think I'm going to set my amount that I give to the church based on what I have? We all do it. Let's be honest about it. And sometimes we lack faith. And and we look at what we have and we wonder, why would God want anything of what I got? Because I have very, very little. Why would he even bother with it? Ever think about serving God and refuse to do so because you think the amount of time you have won't accomplish anything? If this is truly you, then remember Jesus Christ. Remember Andrew and the five loaves and the two fish. Also, when offering our tithes to God, remember that we have a lot here in North America. When I wrote this, I got thinking about the widow. And you got this widow who comes forward, and uh, before her comes all these rich people, and they come inside of the uh, temple system. And and here they are, and they take their money, and it's, it's these big coins. Back then, the bigger the coin and the more noise it made, the more value it had. So they would come in and they would throw their coins into the plate and it'd go clang. And you could hear it verberate everywhere. And everyone would go, wow, you gave an awful lot to God. 
That's impressive. And they'd all look at them. And, of course, these rich people would, you know, look at everybody and go, wow. And they'd be proud as peacocks. Look at what I did. It's great. And Jesus is watching them come in one at a time, throwing their money in, clang. And everybody going, wow, that's a lot of money. And then in comes a widow. She's not dressed the best. She's not dressed like the rich people were, that's for sure. She's in very poor clothing. And she walks in and she has two lousy little mites. Now, mites were worth approximately a part of a day's wage. That's it. And that's all she has to her name. And she takes and she puts them in the plate. And you could barely hear those two little coins hit that plate. I imagine very, very few people could hear that unless they had it very sensitive hearing. And Jesus looks and says, she is the one who's blessed because she gave all that she had. All she had to live on, she gave to me. Absolutely everything. What a beautiful gift Jesus said that she has given. Wow. A leap of faith ultimately might require you to give like the boy in the feeding of the 5,000 or give like this poor widow all that you have to Jesus Christ and watch him do incredible miracles. Ultimately, I think we give out of our abundance rather than giving beyond that abundance. And we should give far more. They did not worry about their lives. They did not worry about what they would eat or drink the next day. Neither one of them did. They just simply gave what they had because they knew God would do miracles in and through their gifts, even if they were tiny. And we've got to get this. Even if what you give is small, remember this. Never underestimate what God can do with your precious and wonderful gift. The third thing that we learn ultimately from Andrew's leadership, I think, is one-on-one -on -one evangelism is absolutely critical. It was critical back then and especially even more so in today's church. Have you ever heard of a man called Edward Kimball? You know what? When I read this, I didn't know who he was. I had never heard of this name whatsoever. Let me tell you a story. Kimball was an antithesis of a bold evangelist. He was timid, a soft-spoken man. He went to the uh, shoe shop frightened, trembling, and unsure of whether he had enough courage to confront this young man with the gospel. At the time, Moody was crude and obviously illiterate. But the thought of speaking to him about Christ had Kimball trembling in his boots. Kimball recalled the incident years later. Moody had begun to attend Sunday school class. It was obvious that Moody was totally untaught and ignorant about the Bible. Kimball said, I decided to speak to Moody about Christ and about his soul. I started downtown to Holton Shoe Store. When I was nearly there, I began to wonder whether I ought to just go in then during business hours or not. I thought maybe my mission might embarrass the boy, and when I went away, the other clerks might ask who I was. And when they learned, they might taunt Moody and ask if I was trying to make him a good boy out of him. While I was pondering over it, I passed the store without noticing it. Then, when I found up the courage that I had, I opened the door, I dashed in, and went over to Moody at once. Kimball found Moody working in the stockroom, wrapping and shelving the shoes. Kimball said he spoke with limpy words. And he later said, I could never remember what I exactly said. It was just something about Christ and his love and him dying on the cross. And he said in his own words, Kimball said, I made a very weak appeal that Moody should get saved. But Moody at that moment gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are still reading the words of D.L. Moody today. You will never know, and I will never know, when we meet somebody and we tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ, what impact that might have on their lives and what their impact might have on other people's lives, we may never know. I think, ultimately, while many people come to know Christ through public evangelistic campaigns, others come to know Christ through one-on-one -on -one relationships. Andrew was the one who introduced the leader of the Twelve, Peter, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Andrew was the one who spent time in the crowd and knew of the boy. I got thinking about that. How did Andrew know that this boy had uh, the five loaves and two fish? How did he know? How did he know the boy existed? How did he know this boy would be willing to give up his lunch, which everybody was thinking, oh my goodness, I'd pay anything to have some food at this time. How did he know this boy would give his lunch up to Jesus? Because most likely he was talking with him. 
Andrew worked the crowds. Andrew spent time with people. He got to know them. He got involved in their lives. And as a result of that, he was the one who said, hey, Jesus, I got this boy who's willing to give up his lunch to you because I know you're going to do a great and wonderful miracle. There is power in one-on-one evangelism. Kimball was the one who introduced Moody to Jesus Christ. I want to conclude this sermon by encouraging you to reach out and develop relationships with those around you. While many Christians through public testimony may many Christians through public testimony might come to know Christ, there are many Christians who are going to come to know Christ through other means. Now you might not be a Billy Graham. You may not preach to billions of people. You may not have millions of people come to know Jesus Christ, but that one person who comes to know Jesus because you plant the seeds of righteousness in their life, are they not worth it? I can tell you to that person, you certainly are worth it. You certainly are. Here's the point. We serve God not to get credit for ourselves and not to get fame and power and glory or to get some type of worldly return on our investment. We serve Christ because we love him. We serve Christ because he died for us. We serve Christ because we were purchased at a price. We serve Christ because we want others to know him. That's why we serve Christ. And I want to say, Christ can take the smallest things, the smallest gifts, the one-on-one evangelisms, and he can make them into an amazing crop and fruits everywhere. And he can do that. Do you have faith? that Jesus Christ can work in and through you. You've been given spiritual gifts just like I have, and God has a plan for you. And that plan is for you to flourish inside of his kingdom, whether you see the fruits of those spirit or not. So will you take that leap of faith? And will you tell Jesus, I'm all in, just like Isaiah, I'm all in. Whatever you want me to do, whether public or private, I'm all in because I love you and I love the people around me. I'm all in. And I hope and pray today you are all in as well. Amen and amen.